Bruce is uh, serving at, I believe it's the Alliance Church in Dubois, and he's going to come up. His, he's got a famous brother, Jason, and uh, because we have two different services, some people don't know who Jason is, but Jason and Jen are here, if you'd stand up, and um, we can, uh, well, they're always here, but um, we're thankful. And I didn't know, I didn't know if Bruce wanted to be known as his brother or not, but Bruce, come on up, and let's give Bruce a warm West Hills welcome. Pastor Steve and I had lunch with Bruce at uh, a Thai restaurant in Indiana, and yeah. he got to share a little bit, and um, I, Steve and I said, church needs to hear Bruce's God story, so God bless you, Bruce. We're glad you're with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Dave. Well, it's uh, interesting to be kind of back in this area. I grew up in this area, so this is one of the first times, probably since high school, I've, I've spoken in this area. So like you said, uh, my name's Bruce. I... Currently serve at the Alliance Church up in Dubois. That is how you say it. There's a hundred different ways to say that, but that's how it's supposed to be pronounced. But uh, the story did not start out uh, how most people may think. I meet a lot of people that think just because I'm a pastor, I serve in a church, and I love Jesus, that, oh, you must come from a Christian family. Everything must have been really good and Christian in your life, and uh, it's actually quite the opposite. So uh, I guess I'll start at the beginning, good place to start a story, where I grew up in, if you know, if you go out 56 till you stop seeing civilization, you had a little town called Ogletown, and that's where I grew up, out on top of the mountain, and uh, loved growing out uh, uh, up in the woods there, Got, you know, had a relatively big family, five boys, no girls, thank God that he didn't bless our family with that, because I don't know how a girl would have survived in the woods with us, so, uh, but... Our family dynamic was very unique. Uh, my father had been in an accident when he was younger and received a pretty large settlement for that. And uh, he lived off of that settlement. And so I grew up in this weird dynamic where neither of my parents ever went to work. They didn't have a job. Uh, and I got to see what I would say is the true spirit of idleness at work in a family. And so we grew up Middle of the woods, our you know, driveway was about a quarter mile long, just back in the woods there, no real neighbors, and just me and the four brothers running around barefoot uh, like cavemen through the woods and just having a, a blast as kids. But uh, that didn't last too long because as we started to get older, we started to realize there was something desperately wrong in our family. Uh, my father struggled with alcoholism pretty severely. Uh, not having a job, not really having much of a purpose. He spent a lot of his time just drinking, and that uh, often turned abusive. Uh, my mother uh, held it together most of the years that we were kids, uh, but she was slowly you know, self-medicating uh, herself and in order to deal with, I'm sure, what was a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety and all the abuse that she was seeing and, and, and was part of herself. And so as, as I began to grow older, well, I guess I'm skipping some stuff. Let me pause. Because when I was about two years old, uh, my parents decided they wanted to become Jehovah Witnesses. And so that was interesting because uh, as we got older, I found out there is more to the Jehovah Witness religion than that you can't give gifts or celebrate birthdays or Christmas. That's the only thing we ever stuck to in the religion uh, was my parents decided, you know, hey, we'll stick to that. No gifts. You know, that, that sounds great. Uh, but we didn't really go a whole lot. Uh, we would go once or twice a year to kind of keep that ruse going, I guess, because if you know a lot about Jehovah Witness religion, it is a works-based religion. And so uh, it's kind of hard to justify that with the lifestyle they lived. And so as we got older, uh, I started to realize probably around eight, nine, ten years old, man, there's something desperately wrong with our family. And I was miserable. I hated growing up in the environment that we were in with the abuse going on and seeing uh, my older brothers uh, really experience a lot of that abuse. They took the brunt of that, uh, but I was certainly not immune to that myself. And so as we were growing older, just the anger the anxiety, the uh, hatred toward my parents grew and grew and grew. And, and I don't know how I knew this other than God, but I knew that whatever was wrong with me was spiritual. 
And there was a hole I was trying to fill, and I knew that God was the only one that fills that hole. And so I began to pour myself into the Jehovah Witness religion, because that's what we said we were. And I learned a lot. I studied a lot. I still enjoy learning and studying and, and diving into to material and learning as much as I can about things. Uh, and so I learned as much as I could. And if, if you were ever, um, probably not a whole lot of you flocked to the Jehovah Witness Kingdom Hall, but if you were ever there, uh, after their service, they go through this time where they go over the watchtower or the I think it's the awake and, and you answer questions and I always knew the answers to the questions because I studied and you know, I, I felt like the, if I just poured myself into this enough, I would fill that void, that hole in my heart. And so I did that. For years and years and years, I would do that. And, and as I started into my teen years, uh, I started to realize hey, this isn't working. I'm really pouring myself into this. I'm learning everything there is to know. I know more than any, probably any other kid my age about God, and yet it seems to be getting worse. As I entered my teen years, I look back and I remember things had gotten progressively worse and worse and worse at home. Uh, I am the third of the five, so I'm the dead center middle child. For some reason, though, uh, I am named after my dad. I'm the junior, and so... Uh, I don't know if there was some resentment to that uh, from his end, but it seemed like as I got a little bit older, I became the target of a lot of the anger uh, and the wrath. I also uh, decided I was a self-proclaimed savior for my family, and so when there was a beating to be had, I often would antagonize my father to take that beating, and uh, he and I became very uh, contentious in our household. Uh, He... I didn't know I was playing a lot of the same sports that he played before his accident. After his accident, he was burned over 75% of his body and couldn't play sports after that. And I I mean, I didn't know. I grew up never once having a conversation with my father, never once having a, you know, an adult or even semi-adult conversation. So I didn't know anything about him. I didn't know what sports he played. I didn't know any of that stuff. I just ended up playing some of the same sports, some of the same positions. And I'm not sure, like I said, if there there was resentment there to that, but uh, it seemed like uh, I was the target of a lot of the anger and wrath. And so, uh, like I said, as I entered into my uh, junior high, those uh, early teen years, I began to fall asleep most nights deciding how best I could end our misery, which for, uh, for me meant killing my dad. And so I would go to sleep many nights dreaming of ways to make it happen and planning it out. Uh, And had God not entered my life, I am convinced that probably would have played out and I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't be here this morning. I'd be sharing in some penitentiary somewhere, but uh, that was what was in my heart. So much anger, so much uh, rage uh, toward my father and and the abuse that took place. It was many a night that we would uh, hole ourselves up in, actually my brother who's here, and in his room, and we'd push the dresser in front of the door when my dad was in one of his moods and one of those rages, and uh, we'd just kind of hold, try to hold out for the night until he passed out. And um, that happened many times. We ended up moving to Philly when I was in third grade for a very short period of time um, just to get away from it all. And I uh, thought that we were saved, we were rescued, and we would never have to go back. And my mom ended up going back into the environment. And uh, I'm, I know she had her reasons, and I would never blame her for a lot of what occurred. She was in a tough situation. I mean, she was very young. I was I'm the third of five, and I think she was 20 when she had me, so she started when she was 14. And so just a a difficult family uh, life, difficult family altogether. And so uh, as I was in those early teen years and planning how to kill my dad and how to get away with it and how, uh, that wasn't even the biggest concern, it was just how to do it so that my brothers didn't have to suffer like I suffered, so that my family would no longer have to suffer. And so... At one point, I had a friend that went to a church in Johnstown who lived all the way out in Ogletown, and he invited me. He said, hey, you know, we play basketball, we play volleyball in, uh, like I think it was Friday night or Saturday night, they had this thing where they'd play sports. And as a good Jehovah Witness, I would never enter a sanctuary outside of the Kingdom Hall because you're not allowed to do that. And so they, this took place in a gym, and I thought, oh, this is great. I can do that. I was a jock at heart. I loved to play sports. Anytime there were sports being played, I was there because it meant I was out of my house. Uh, so that was a big bonus. And so I started going to this volleyball, basketball thing and, and hanging out. And they would always give like a five-minute devotional. And if you've ever met a highly stubborn 
arrogant preteen. Uh, that was me. I knew that I knew more than the rest of them when they would share their little devotional. And you know, already I thought I knew more than every Christian that ever existed. Anyhow, as a Jehovah Witness, that's kind of the air that you have as you know more than everybody and you have all the answers. And so they would share a little five minute devotion. I always remember thinking, oh, these guys are so silly. Like they think that Jesus was actually God and all this stuff. And uh, that went on for, I'm not sure exactly how long. I think I started doing that when I was 12 or 13 years old. And, and then one week they invited me to what they called a sports weekend. And I thought, that sounds like the best thing ever, like a sports weekend. And so I signed up right away and I got there. And as you know, there is no such thing as a sports weekend, but there are these things called church retreats. And so uh, I don't know what your theology is on this, but praise Jesus, they lied. And they told me it was a sports weekend. It's probably one of the kids, I'm not saying an adult did that, but uh, so I, I went to this sports weekend and as a good Jehovah Witness who was stubborn, uh, more stubborn than any kid probably uh, that I've met, I, would, I refused to go into the services. I would not go into their services. I would go and I'd shoot hoops uh, during the service and uh, there was a kid, I was about 14 at this time and there was a kid about 18 years old who would, started following me over there didn't rebuke me, didn't tell me how wrong I was and yell at me to go get in the, into the service, but would just, you know, played sports with me, shot, uh, shoot some hoops with me and, and have a little fun. And he earned a lot of credit with me for the few times, of, you know, every service that that happened, however many that was in that weekend. And he said, hey, I'm sharing my testimony at the campfire uh, this, that last night. And he said, I'd love it if you'd come and share. It's not in a building, it's not in a sanctuary, so, you know, it wouldn't go against your religion. And I said, well, you know, he had earned enough credit with me that I said, yes. I said, okay, I'll go hear your testimony. And so went to the campfire, and as he was sharing his testimony, he talked a lot about his life. Now, up until this point, I had a very limited scope of what life was. I knew a few kids who were relatively wealthy. It seemed like their parents were happy. They had a lot of money. Everything was good in their family. I knew a lot of my friends who were poor and whose mom and dad either were divorced or were just about there and there was a lot of abuse. And so I just kind of had this weird dichotomy in my mind of if you're poor and you grow up like a kind of like a white trash kid like I did, uh, then that's the life you have and you're miserable. And if you're happy, you grew up wealthy and you had your parents were happy and, and they were healthy as well. And so when he shared his testimony, I had already categorized this kid in my mind as happy, came from a wealthy family, everything's good in his life, and he shared a story that was very similar to mine. You also have to understand as a Jehovah Witness, I thought my understanding of Christians was they made stuff up to get people to convert. And so they made a lot of stories up because they didn't know the Bible, so they had to make the rest of the stuff up. And so my immediate response to this was he just made this story up he used a story very much like mine to try to manipulate all these people to accept his version of Jesus. And so, as uh, an interesting child that I was, uh, after the service, I'm sure the entire camp heard every curse word I ever do as I cursed this guy out uh, because I thought, how dare you use a story like, you don't know what it's like to be truly miserable in, in your life. And so I laid into this guy and just cursed and swore at him and was horrible to him. And he was patient enough to wait that out and then to share with me, no, that really is how he grew up. That really was his story. And I remember thinking and asking him, like, then, then how? Like, how are you the way you are? And I don't know who this kid is. I can't wait to, to meet him in heaven someday because I did not keep up with him or, you know, it didn't even dawn on me to like, oh, I should probably learn that kid's name. But what I can tell you is he was terrible at sharing the gospel. I mean, horrible at it. But it's exactly what I needed. I didn't need someone to try to convince me to Jesus. I didn't need someone that, that showed me their intellectual superiority or that they could answer all my questions right. Because as he was sharing, I remember thinking this, I was very arrogant, I remember thinking, this guy doesn't, he is terrible at this, but he believes what he's saying. Like this Jesus, his version of Jesus, it really did change his life. That's, that was beyond a shadow of a doubt, that was, I knew that was the case. And I thought, well, this guy doesn't have the answer, so I gotta figure out 
who this Jesus is. I've got to learn more about this. And so the following Sunday, there I was in church uh, in their service, gave up uh, on the drop of a hat, gave up the Jehovah Witness because I knew I had begun praying a year or two before that. <coughs> Sorry. God, if, if this isn't the right religion, you've got to show me what, what is because I am really pouring myself into this and I'm not finding the answers that I know are out there. And so I knew when his, that kid was sharing about what God and Jesus had done in his life, I knew that's the answer to my soul, to my heart. And so I, I really did. I dove right in. And growing up all the way out in Ogletown, you know, we barely left our town except to go to the shore every now and then and a few other places. But I, a guy rolled through town, uh, an advanced street evangelist, and he said, hey, I'm going to, I think it was Point Pleasant, New Jersey. I'm going to New York City. Who wants to go with me? And I said, I'm in. Uh, I'm ready to go. And so I found myself uh, in New York City sharing my version of the gospel because they forgot to teach me the gospel before I went. And so uh, here I am on the street uh, talking to people about Jesus, the archangel who's going to save their soul because uh, no one told me the answers to the, you know, I hadn't really discovered all the answers to the questions yet. And this is, I think, two weeks after I came to know Christ. And Again, not sure on your theology on that, but I trusted in Jesus without fully understanding and grasping who he was, just knew that he was the answer to the problems of my soul. And <clears throat> previously to coming to know Jesus, I had one major problem uh, that you might not notice today. I was absolutely petrified of speaking in public. I remember giving a, a lesson in school on how to do something. And I loved to cook at this point. My grandmother uh, was kind of my role model in life and she would, I loved spending time with her and she would teach me how to cook. And so it's one thing I knew how to do, it was, it was how to cook. And I thought, man, if I have to share something, I better share something I really know like the back of my hand. So I decided I would share how to make tapioca pudding. And then my note cards fell off the stand in the middle of it and I froze and just stared at the camera until they had to make me move. Uh, because that's how uh, deathly afraid of it I was. But uh, immediately upon learning about Jesus and, and, and him becoming my savior, I had this desire and this passion to be in front of people and to talk and to tell them about Jesus. And never once have I ever felt nervous again or, or at, in any way uh, shy about sharing in public about Jesus. And so it was an immediate switch for me. Something changed uh, when I came to know Jesus. And so it wasn't long after that I realized... Uh, now that I'm a Christian, I probably shouldn't be planning my dad's murder uh, laying in bed at night. Um, at least I, I gathered that in my teachings. And so I, I was trying to figure out a way to get out of my house. I was still only about 14, maybe 15, and my grandmother was going to go through a quadruple bypass surgery. So I thought, this is perfect. I'll, I'll go take care of her and I just won't come back. And my, now my grandparents only lived about a mile from my house. And so they were pretty much as close to neighbors as neighbors get in Ogle Town. And so I moved in with them at, at about 14, 15. And uh, I, went, I think I only went back to my house for about a, a week or two between then and when I graduated high school. But as I continued to journey with Jesus, uh, God made it pretty clear there was a call in my life. And I've got to be honest, I didn't want to accept it because I had big plans for my life. I wanted to be an architect. I wanted to make some money. I wanted to prove myself and show my brothers that I, I was somebody important and I was going to be rich. I knew I had the brains for it. I knew I had the, the ability to do it. And so I had no interest in going to a Bible school and becoming a pastor because from what I saw, uh, they weren't all that impressive. And so uh, I can't really tell you how I ended up at Lancaster Bible College, but I did. I ended up at Lancaster Bible College. And uh, und I went in undecided because I still wouldn't admit that God was calling me to be a pastor and had a, that call in my life. And so uh, I went in undecided and it took a year or so of wrestling with God to, to get to that point of admitting that God wanted that in my life. But another interesting facet to my story was uh, I almost didn't make it in college. I was at college for three days and I got a call from my mom, and she said, I just want you to know everybody's okay, which is a great way to start a phone call. Uh, and I had told you I had kind of accepted the personal savior role for my family and decided it was my job to protect them. It was my job to keep my family safe and to do what I could to help them, especially my younger brothers, uh, that, they didn't, that they wouldn't suffer the same fate and the same 
dysfunction that I suffered. And, and so, again, was at college for three days. I hadn't, college hadn't actually officially started yet. It was freshman there for orientation. And um, I found out that my dad had tried to, to light the house on fire while everybody was sleeping that night because they didn't take him to uh, my brother's, I think it was baseball game or football game. Uh, and he was really angry about that. And we grew up in a house that was almost 100% wood. It was like a wood cabin out there in the woods. And, and so I thought, man, my family almost died. And that was my job to keep them safe. And so I was really wrestling. I almost left college, went back home. Uh, I already felt guilty enough that I had moved out. And I felt like it was my responsibility to be there to take care of them and, and to uh, make sure that, that they were safe. Uh, and so had a about a week wrestling with God and just really not knowing what to do with that situation and really not knowing where God wanted me because I felt like I should be home and then God made it very clear to me that he is much bigger than I am and he can care for my family much better than I can. And so um, that became uh, very obvious. And uh, my journey is one, uh, that's a large part of uh, the story, the, the path that God has brought me on. And he, he has shown himself to be true so many different ways and so many uh, different facets. I even, when I, after I came to know Jesus, I started attending that church that had invited me to the sports weekend. And uh, I actually, my Sunday school teacher is still here. Say hi, Jane. I know, I, I used to drive her crazy. I just had to do it one more time, Jane. Um, if you know a kid that's in the, like the junior high-ish age and you think, that kid is a train wreck. I can't stand that kid, and I can't wait till he leaves. He might become a pastor someday. Uh, <laughs> that's my story, uh, and you know I'm just the redeemed version of that. So they decided, well, we might as well call him a pastor uh, because we tend to be a little crazy. Those of us that get that calling, but. It still amazes me as I look back and I see how God brought me through all these different stages of life and how even after I came to know Jesus, I was still a very rough kid, very difficult person. Uh, I was, like I said, drove my Sunday school teacher nuts and, and didn't know what to do with my life, still had this anger and this rage that God took years to kind of pull out of me and, and, and uh, heal a lot of those wounds uh, from, from childhood. But I learned that God can use anybody to do anything. There really is no place for, well, I'm just not gifted enough. I don't have the skills. I don't have the ability. Because if there was a kid who didn't have anything going for him, didn't have any abilities, it was me. And yet God called me. A verse that means a lot to me or a passage is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verses 27 to 31, it says, Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world. What is viewed as nothing to bring to nothing what is viewed as something. So that no one can boast in his presence. But it is from him that you are in Christ Jesus who became God-given wisdom for us, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. In order that, as it is written... The one who boasts must boast in the Lord. And I love telling my story about what God has done because there is no way that I can spin that story where I get to pat myself on the back and say, man, I did a good job. And I've had a lot of Christians, I'm sure they're well-meaning, as they tell me like, wow, your, your life is so impressive. You, you did, it's so amazing that you got yourself out of that situation that you grew up in and, and you made something of yourself and you became a pastor and I just laugh. Like, there was no getting myself out of that. My brother, I have what they kind of call an Irish twin. We're almost exactly a year apart. He didn't end up like I did. He went the path that I probably would have went without Jesus in my life and spent a lot of time in uh, jail and, and uh, doing the wrong things, which, again, he and I were thick as thieves, and we would, have, I'm sure, have been in the same situations. And I am confident that uh, had I followed in his footsteps, I wouldn't be here today. I learned something. Um, part of my story that I, I like to tell is uh, at one point in my life, I became a personal trainer. I love working out. I love helping other people you know, achieve goals and, and make more of themselves and, and, and feel good about themselves. And one of my clients was a pain management therapist. And I said, hey, I've got this weird thing. I 
can't take pain medication. It doesn't do absolutely anything for me. I'm immune to Novocaine, I'm immune to these different things. And, and this pain management therapist told me, she said, oh yeah, there's a very rare condition, but your pain receptors don't accept these things. And you might wonder why I'm telling you this. She said, yeah, you never did drugs, did you? I said, no, my whole family up until me did drugs. She said, yeah, you would have died. She said, you wouldn't have felt it. You'd have just kept taking it and taking it, trying to get that high until your heart just stopped. And I look back and I say, man, God, you are, you're amazing. Probably the first time I would have tried drugs, I would have been dead. And that would have been the end of my story. And so there's God, even in something I had no idea existed, other than the fact that when I get my teeth worked on, I have to do it without Novocaine. Uh, all I had to do was one time go down that road, and that would have been the end for me. And I, had, I, did not, I did not know that. And I do want to encourage you with another verse here is that I don't know where that kid is that shared the gospel with me. I, I, one day maybe he'll, he'll hear my story and I hope he doesn't get offended when I say he did it terribly. But how many of us often when we're encouraged to or we feel the need to go share the gospel with somebody, boy, we got a lot of excuses. I don't really know a lot. I'm not a Bible scholar. I never went to, I never even finished high school. I don't know enough. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, When I came to you, brothers, announcing the testimony of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. For I didn't think it was a good idea to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a powerful demonstration by the Spirit, so that your faith might not be based on men's wisdom, but on God's power. And the last thing this world needs is more charismatic Christians who think they got it all figured out. God can do a whole lot more with here I am, send me, than okay, I finally have it all figured out, Jesus, now you can use me. Can't do a whole lot with that second group of people, but people that are just willing to say, God, here I am, send me. I'm willing to go. And that kid, thank God that he was willing to go, willing to share his story. He was definitely not gifted in it. He was not schooled. He didn't have the right words. His theology, I don't know where it was, but his heart was true to Jesus. He knew Jesus Christ and him crucified. And when he shared, that was exactly what my heart needed. And there are so many people in this world, that's what they need. They need to hear what God has done in our lives, the power of what Jesus has done. You don't have to worry about knowing the right answers. You don't even have to worry about doing it any good but just to be true to what God has done in your life in Revelation makes it pretty clear how Satan is defeated. It says in Revelation 12, 11, they conquered him by the blood of the lamb, most of us know that part, and by the word of their testimony, for they did not love their lives in the face of death. Our testimonies have tremendous power. Someone's testimony is why I'm here today because he was willing to share his testimony at a campfire and then deal with the kid as he cursed him out and then share Jesus again from his heart in a way that tr changed my life, transformed me, and now I've had the opportunity to interact with so many other people's eternities, all because he was willing to say something at a campfire. And so I encourage you this evening, wherever God takes you, wherever you are, don't worry about having it all together, don't worry about having all the answers, just here I am, Lord. Send me. If you're waiting until you got it figured out, if you're waiting until your life is good enough that God can use you, if you're waiting until you've got enough answers or you're in a, in a righteous enough place that God can use you, you'll probably never get there. But just to be available and just to be used by God because you'll never know whose eternity you're gonna change. Amen?